Do you remember the first thing you wrote with John and, and how did that come up? I do. I, I do. And it's an interesting story. It was, um, I was working with my guitar player in New York and I had just gotten a, a sampler, you know, the, the whole big thing was the samplers and the keyboards were, da, 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 you know, that whole thing. And I had digital audio. I had a, a small studio in my house in the mountains and I sampled one of our shows and I had a bass part of John's. And so I sampled it into an A section and a B section. And then I played some drums to it. And I had my guitar player come over and put some chords to it. And I called John up in California and I said, uh, we just wrote our first song. And he said, really, how did we do that? And I said, well, listen, and this was in, still in the days of landline, right? So you could hear music over the phone. And I played it for him. And, you know, my guitar player was, was fantastically, uh, the day, fantastically appropriate for the music. And we wrote this song. And John said, well, that's great. You know, we had, and then we had gotten a deal uh, to do this TV show. And so we had, we wanted to get a record deal. I went to England, we did some demos. And he said, you know, bring that song with you. And I said, okay. And I, I played him the two parts and then he wrote the third musical part. And then he wrote the lyrics. So we're in the studio in England, right? We're, we don't really know what we're going to do. Everybody brought their cassettes and all their samples of stuff that they've written. And John had a bunch of stuff. And I had this, this song. And John comes walking in from the other room with a glossy, big, like a, like a, a Rand McNally map size book, you know, with the, like a tour book. Only it was called Endless Vacation. And it was about all the exotic spots around the globe that you can go on vacation from Cabo to, you know, Cairo, wherever. And he said to me, walks in and I have had a video camera in my hand, I was video in the studio. And he said, have you seen this new book about the who? Endless vacation. Right. And I, I laughed because I knew that, you know, they never toured enough for him. He would have played, he would have been out, he would have been in rat race. He would have played six nights a, a week uh, you know, 50 weeks a year for decades, if he could have, that's just John. So it gives him the idea and he actually writes the song Endless Vacation, which I think is on the, is on the first, on volume one, maybe I put it on volume one. And it's about the fact that the who never toured enough, you know, uh, nobody told me life up here as a rock star was an endless vacation. Hope I get old before I die, my mama degeneration. So he was, you know, he was kind of taking jabs at the Who. And that was the first song we wrote together. And he was so clever and so skilled at at composing and, and the way he fit in, because it needed a third part. And the way he it was just it was miraculous. It was like it was meant to be. So that was the first thing that we wrote together. And then um, we wrote horror rock. I had I had written the A section and the B section to horror rock, which was actually called horror rock in '85. And I brought that out, and he said, "Oh, this is great." And we had gotten a deal by this time to do the soundtrack for a children's television show called Vampires V A N hyphen Pires about derelict cars in a junkyard that get hit by a meteor and suck the gas out of other cars. And the kids are in a rock band. They rehearse in the junkyard and they get turned into superheroes and fight the vampires. So he said, that's just be a great theme song. And so we wrote horror rock as a vampire's theme. And then we did 13 uh, other songs, you know, one song per episode. Um, and so those are the first two things that we wrote together. And, and the parts that he added to horror rock, which just brought it right. I mean, I had written it, you know, 11, 12 years before that, the, the A and B section. And what he put in just felt like it. I mean, when I listen to it today, uh, it feels like it always went that way. It's just, he was just, I can't, I, I can't overemphasize how brilliant and how appropriate he was and how he knew what would complete something and it didn't you didn't need to change anything just put this in there and to that point this is a, a fun i think sometimes is on the new on volume two and we had written sometimes together and the challenge of writing for vampires was it had to be child appropriate no sex no drugs no weapons no violence 
what do you write about? So, um, you know, we had to write coming of age type of things. And I, I had written this song called Sometimes and he wrote the middle eight and, and helped me with the lyrics and we wrote back and forth. And then one day we're about to record it in the studio because um, he had a, you know, he had like Warner Brothers downstairs in his house. And so he comes down at noon. He always came into the studio at noon. Bobby Pridden and I had already been working up the tracks and getting mixes ready or whatever we were going to do for the day. And he comes in with this um, little notepad, like a, a music with staffs on it, staves as they call them, but blank so that you could write your music lessons on them. And a little, little book like this big with, you know, six staffs on it. And he had written in pencil whole notes, eight bars of whole notes, you know, clusters, five, six note clusters. And he said, this is the intro for sometimes. And I said, it is? <laughs> When did you do this? He said, I was falling asleep last night and it came to me and I wrote it down. And I said, oh, okay. So he says to the keyboard player, here, he puts the music in front of him. He says, play these chords. And the keyboard plays this cluster and it's like horrible. <laughs> and then he plays the next chord and it's worse. And he plays the next chord and I, these eight chords just got more and more dissonant. And I was about to say, whoa, whoa, what the, you know, come on. But then I said to myself, you know what? You've been here long enough. You should wait and see where this goes. And he taught the part to the guitar player, had the part of the keyboard player. We knew what we were going to do. And when he added the bass part in on the bottom, it was like an orchestra. It was all of a sudden, it was like, I'm glad I kept my mouth shut. And to think that he's lying in bed thinking this musical cacophony in his mind and the and complexity right. and to know to use the dissident notes in that way and see how his thing was going to fit in underneath it was just it was unbelievable it was like mozart-esque and and it, if you listen to that song it starts with those eight chords and then they're you know then they're in the run out they they happen again but it was just it was beyond anything that i was capable of even thinking he was such a brilliant student of music and it's, you know, so that's kind of how it went <laughs> from there on in. He was just great. I'm wondering if there is a John Entwistle band song or album that kind of stands out to you the most after all these years. Is there one that has a special, it's, I know it's like trying to pick which child is your favorite. And I know you get asked these questions a lot, but you know, is there one that that is near, dear and special to you in a different way than the others? I would have to say volume two, the new one, because it's got a little bit, you know, we did Left for Live. We did Left for Live for Deluxe, which was the, you know, two CD set. We did music from Vampires, which was the 13 studio tracks. But but volume two, you know, I did volume one and, and I have the archive of all the shows that we did. We did we recorded every live show that we did and i had outtakes and and uh alternate mixes of songs that we did in the studio i had you know just about everything that we did and when i got the chance to do this you know collection of songs volume one was good it was it was it was solid the the material was there um and then when i really had the time to dig into volume two I think, you know, I think it, it hits all the notes for me, no pun intended. Um, it, it touches on all the areas, the spontaneity, the jamming, the clever, you know, writing, the, the lyrics. It was just, so I think it's really, it would have to be volume two of Oxumed because it's, it just, it ticks all the boxes for me. It's, it's live at Leeds meets who's next. And, and please, I don't want anybody to jump on me because we were not the who or trying to be. But if I had to, you know, put it in that for you, it was that, for you. That's for me, what it was. Yeah, for me, absolutely. It was. And, the, uh, I was going to say, I mean, was this stuff, I mean, you mentioned that you had come upon this stuff, but I mean, was there a, a you know, did you stumble upon a treasure trove of stuff that, that John had as well? Yeah, because in, when we when we knew that we were going to get the the deal to do the to do the studio record, we traded tapes and this was by this time there were dats. We had dat tapes 
And John, I mean, I have hours and hours and hours of just John playing bass parts with a drum machine or with a keyboard part, and it's just endless. And I thought, man, I could finish these, I could play to these, I could carve these up and do something. But I didn't know, I mean, it certainly what wouldn't have been appropriate for volume two. Um, the one thing that I did get to do that's on volume one is Pete, when, when, when Townsend heard Vampires, our studio record, he asked Bobby Pridden, to ask us to write some songs for a you know, possible inclusion on a new Who album, which was like, you know, who gets to do that? And so we wrote, he said, you know, they, they want us to write seven songs and they'll pick up to four. And I'm thinking, man, you kidding me? And yeah, to my best of my knowledge, John never co-wrote with anybody. There's no co-writes on his solo albums. So for him to be that trusting of me as a co-writer, for something that monumental and and we had it you know we and, had and it down. something that's gonna face scrutiny With big time scrutiny yeah and it was it was odd because you know here when we wrote for us we were just writing for us but when we wrote for the who had to write in the keys that were good for roger had to write at the tempos that were right for pete and uh, you know just it was just it was amazing it wasn't constraints, but there was a kind of like a guide, you know, a guide that you had to follow in order for it to be, you couldn't just go nuts. And you, wouldn't had, be, and you wouldn't be thinking of a drumming like you, you'd probably be thinking of a drumming like what, Zach? Well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I would be absolutely thinking of that. I, um, and you, you know, you, not that you dumb it down, but you don't want the, you don't want the, demo to be unattainable so we made it accessible I, I mean i programmed the drums i didn't even really actually play them but i programmed the parts john played bass i played guitar and we both played some keyboards and i wound up singing the the rough track you know the rough vocal and there were two songs that he said yeah these are going to make it these are going to make it and those are on on the first on volume one because you know sadly enough we didn't ever get the chance to do that because john passed and so that was the end of that project. But I really wanted people to hear what we had done for this potential, you know, what might have been. So even though they're rough, we didn't do them in the big studio. We did them in his demo studio upstairs. And even though they're very rough, raw tracks and, you know, I mean, I'm not Roger Daltrey or would never pretend to be. And I'm singing in his key. So it's a strain for me. But the ideas were there. And I said, you know what? Somebody should hear what we did. There were two songs. Um, uh, come on, I can't. Now I'm going to blank on them. Life okay. Goes On. Life Goes On, which was the last song we ever wrote together, ironically. And Where Are You Going Now? And I remember the day that we did both of those songs. We, had, we did seven songs, but those were the two that really, if you listen to them, you could hear that these guys would take them to the next level. Zach would have killed these tracks. I mean, you know, in the most positive way, he's the perfect drummer for this version of the who right now. Um, you couldn't have a guy like me in there because I'm too, probably too much of the old school and they had gone to a new place, you know, after Kenny Jones and Simon Phillips and so on and so forth. So I kept the, the drums aggressive, but you know, tamed down so that Zach could take him to wherever he wanted to take him. 